section called Titled Action, Part 1. Um, we interrupt this program by A.T. Hagen. Within ten minutes of the children's departure, Kate Daniels and her two older boys arrived at the house, followed soon after by Melinda, Heather, Jimmy Bryant, and his brother Don, who had come to stay with him. Not long after Anne came back with two more of their neighbors, Ed Strickland and Rick Young. Their faces grew grave as John explained to them the encounter he'd had with the soldiers and the implications it held for them all. they just begun to discuss possible options when Robert and Lisa came back in the truck with four more in the back. John knew the name of only one, Steve, who he'd met at Miguel's farm from time to time, and three others who he'd seen in Archer but had never spoken with before, but who turned out to live between them and Miguel. He explained the situation to them, and just as he was finishing, Miguel arrived, driving a large flatbed Ford with his sons Roberto and Albert and seven others John assumed were Miguel's neighbors. Once again, he launched into an explanation of the National Recovery Executive Directive and its implications. Jimmy said, Damn it, the sheriff's posse just killed four men for wrestling, and here comes the government to do the same thing and call it requisitioning. We're all going to be hard put to avoid starving before next year's crops come in if the winter is as bad as John says it's going to be. If they take what they please of our livestock and feed, we'll starve for sure. Well, there are a lot of refugees in Gainesville, Ocala, Lake City, up to Newberry, over to Palatka, and probably a lot of other places I haven't heard of, a woman said, who John hadn't met before, but who had come with Miguel. The government's got to feed them. It's only natural they look to area farmers for the food. But that's just the problem, Angela, Miguel explained. Except for Ed here, none of us here are farmers. I doubt that any of us here have made more than pocket change from what we, that, from what we raise on our land with grocery delivery stopped. We're eating it all. And with grocery delivery stopped, we're eating it all. Even that's not quite enough. Maybe Ed here has enough cattle that he could let some go, but... What, they, what are they going to pay for them with, and how are they going to determine their worth? Do you know what a dollar is worth now? Government price controls won't let food products be sold for more than 10% over what they brought a month ago. But there's very little to be bought from price-controlled suppliers. Flour went for $1.25 a pound at the new Archer Market last weekend. Next weekend, I expect it'll be at least a dollar and a half, maybe more. Since this is the government, they're going to pay what the price control board says the cattle are worth and pay for them with dollars that lose value every day. They'll pay a pittance for what they take and we'll be short of food with no way to get more. Rick said, they're not searching my place and that's a fact. I've got my sister and her kids with me and we're all losing weight as it is. As soon as the weather gets cold, we're going to butcher my two pigs so we can stop feeding them. Like as not, we'll be eating the pig feed before anything we plant comes in. Ed Strickland joined in. Well, I'm willing to sell them cattle. What with having lost that last cutting, have hay to the rain, and the possibility of a prolonged winter, I'm not going to be able to feed them all, so someone might as well eat them. I'll be damned if they'll just waltz in and tell me how many I'll sell, and for how much, though. I'll sell for a reasonable price, but I'll decide how many I sell, not them. Kate Daniel said, John... I've got a message into Mike over the radio to come here right away, and I told him what Heather and Mel told me. He said he was on the way, but he didn't know what he'd be able to do. Do you have a plan or anything? John paused for a moment before speaking. Well, the most important thing is not let them take the food we're going to need to survive the winter. And the second most important thing is to make sure no one gets hurt. I can't help but think that if the whole community presents a visibly united front, they'll listen to reason. They'll probably listen, to be listen better if we can get them at a disadvantage, though, where they can't damage our homes. He turned, looked at Jimmy, and asked, You were in the infantry in Vietnam, so you've had some experience in this. Is there some place we can box them up and make them listen to us? The man considered for a moment before replying. Yeah, I think we can barricade the road on just this side of Skunk Bend, where the tree line crowds the road on both sides. We can block them there. Of course, it all depends on what they come with. Nothing we have is going to trouble even an APC, much less any real armor. A few Hummers and a couple of trucks or something we can make an attempt with. And put in, when they left us, when they left, 
When they left, all they knew was they were dealing with us, just us and Lisa. If they think there's just four adults and a couple of kids, would they send a lot of troops with the situation in town being as bad as we keep hearing it is? Jimmy said, you might have a point. They're really short on manpower from what Mike tells me. So for just one family of holdouts, they may not send more than a couple of Hummers. We can probably deal with those if we get them at a disadvantage. I'll go get my chainsaw and John, you get yours and let's head to Skunk Bend. The group nodded. Miguel said, if there's anyone that doesn't want to be a part of this, say so, and I'll drop you off. I'm going back to my place so Roberto can get the other truck. John will meet you at Skunk Bend. Vaya con Dios. In case you don't know what that means, that's God go or go, go with God. Vaya con with Dios, God. All right. Voyage with God. <laughs> 